So we're going to be talking today about returning to work after having a lung transplant uh, and also a little bit about the pre-transplant working uh approach as well because sometimes people find with their reduced lung capacity that that also impacts what they're able to do uh, work-wise but yeah the main focus will be on returning to work and and the experiences so uh, the three of us are going to share our stories and and uh, we're obviously just a sample of the lung transplant population but hopefully some of the things we talk about might uh, be useful. So we'll just go around and introduce ourselves briefly, uh, share, you know, how many years we're out and what type of lung transplant we had and the sort of work that we were doing uh, pre-post. So I'll start. Um, my name's Wendy Jenkins. Uh, a few of you may know me from Connection with Longitude. And uh, when I had my lung transplant, I was actually working for Shell Australia in the uh, city at the time uh, and, yeah, managing a few teams and uh, I cut back uh, my hours because I was getting quite breathless. Um, and so when I returned to work, it was in a reduced capacity and I sort of built up from, from there. Uh, maybe Sajani, if you'd like to introduce yourself and share your story. Yeah, Wendy. Um, thanks. So um, I was actually diagnosed with hypersensitive pneumonitis when I was in Sri Lanka in 2013, but I was very fit. It was just a random check and that's how we got to know, but I did not have any symptoms. But recently um, in Australia, in 2022 April, I went to Tasmania and went on hikes also, but then suddenly I got corona and influenza within a few months. And that's when everything started to go drastically downwards. And in November, I had breathing problems and I had to go on oxygen. Uh, then it kept on increasing and doctors did not have any other option other than a lung transplant. They only had, I mean, they said I only have one month. That's how, uh, that's how the, my oxygen level was uh, increasing. Right. So, um, so fortunately from Adelaide, I'm in Adelaide and the RAH doctors, which are, they are very, very helpful and very, very kind. They quickly arranged me to move into Melbourne and that's how I got my transplant in January this year. It's just been 10 years. Yeah. And by the time I was working from home to, to a Melbourne company called, called Lime Point, they were very supportive. They, uh, asked me to go on leave during the operation time and they said, asked me to come back even after the operation. So after three months again, I jo I joined uh, Lime Point and that's where I'm working currently. Yeah, great. Um, all right, no, that's great. That gives everyone a bit of a, a background on you. Um, so that'll be helpful as we go through the discussion. Um, and Peter, or should I say Sergeant Peter Anderson? Yes, indeed. So I've been a, a sergeant and a member with Victoria Police for about 42, 43 years. Uh, I'm the officer in charge of a rural police station in Western Victoria. Um, I started going downhill physically, feeling uh, unwell uh, a number of years ago. And about 2018, that was formally diagnosed as interstitial lung disease. Uh, and I became a patient of the Alfred Hospital at that time. Um, right up until I was actually contacted that a donor had been found for me. That day I was actually working and in uniform when the telephone call came oh. through. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we probably all understand post-op post that experience of receiving a phone call and the uh, we've got good news for you and that feeling of dread that comes over you at that time. Um, post-op I had a, a very good recovery, I think, and um, I spent five months approximately on sick leave and I was going stir crazy on sick leave. So I was obviously feeling much better than I'd felt for many, many years. And I reached out and returned to work in a limited capacity um, for about five or six months and then returned to full operational duties, which I'm performing now, still at the station I was at prior to my transplant. Right, great. So we've all returned back to where we were working. Uh, and, you know, technically, you know, it depends on your working conditions, but 
uh, yeah, generally if you're off on um, sick leave or an a leave arrangement with your workplace, then, uh, yeah, they should be trying to get you to come back to work as well afterwards and, uh, yeah, try to have a, a plan to um, bring you back in um, on a, what we what we called it shell return to work plan and they can vary a bit depending on the organisation you're with. But, um, yeah, definitely if you're in a situation where you're wanting to return to work and things are uh, a bit tricky with your workplace, it's definitely something to look into. So... What were some of the the thought processes or the decisions that you know things that you had to think about um, when you returned to work? Was it an was it an easy decision for you, Susan? Did you just go, "Yep, that's what I want to do. I want to go back to work." That was that was sort of simple, or did you have a few things you sort of um denied about? Um, so actually, I did not have time, as in, to even think about my transplant. It was so quickly. It happened so quickly. So I was working until the last moment as well. Mm -hmm. So my mind was always on like work, work, work. Yeah. So uh, like after the transplant for three months, while I was at home, I was feeling a bit lonely without actually working. Uh, even though it's relaxing, sometimes you feel that you actually need to work or occupy your head on something to get forget all the problems. So that's one reason I wanted to come back to work. And also the other reason is like the office actually helped me with financial stuff. So I felt obliged that I should help them back again. Wow. That's another reason yeah. I wanted to work for them. Um, yeah, you mean, uh, at the beginning, I like um, had to adjust some stuff, like because I had to take medicines and also consider myself go on walks and adjust timings of my work. It took time to actually uh, figure out a routine. <clears throat> it was a bit, bit challenging at the beginning, <clears throat> yeah. but then now I'm used to it. So, yeah. so you like, if someone likes to actually work, they, I mean, it's always possible. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I think it's yeah, like you said, it's good to keep occupied up here. Because yes. you can go a bit stir crazy just sitting at home, and you need, you need a bit of a purpose. Um, mm -hmm. How about you, Peter? What, how did you? What was your so going through your decision making process? Um, I don't know that much was Wendy. Um, you know, I was in that sort of brain fog phase, and I probably felt post op. I felt a million dollars, and I had always decided that I would retire. And it was when I, as I was recovering and getting progressively better although I still had this brain fog happening, um, I thought, gee, I'm not as bad. You know, I, I expected to sort of be happy that I was alive, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. and just probably limited a little. And I found, you know, that I that I came physically, came, came good really quickly. Um, and that's when I started to get really bored and thought, gee, that was a bit of a mistake saying I'd retire, I think. You know, I don't think I can. I don't think I'm ready for retirement yet. And, uh, but I was a bit naive too because uh, when I went back, um, I didn't realise how that brain fog would affect me and I lost confidence very rapidly because I felt muddle-headed. I felt that I couldn't make a decision, uh, which was something that I've always prided myself in um, and stuff like that. So I really had a crisis of confidence, but that has since passed. Obviously, yeah. but that brain fog is very real. But yeah. once I got over that, I was right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I, I definitely had that brain fog as well. And I think I've shared this story before, but my I remember my boss and some of my um staff saying to me much later because they didn't want to rock my confidence at the time is that for the first few months when I was back they would follow by kind of fixing my what I was doing because I was making a few little errors I thought I was doing really well <laughs> but yeah the brain fog had set in and in the sort of role I was in yeah you can't really make too many errors so they were kind of just double checking everything a bit more than normal uh, which is fine. Like I don't, I'm, I'm kind of glad that they did that. Um, but yeah, I remember the very first time day when I was officially back at work after having five months off. And again, Shell was terrific. They really looked after me when it came to leave. It was just indefinite leave until I kind of came back and they paid for that, even though I ran, had a long time run out. Um, so that's one of the benefits of working for some big companies. 
But um, yeah, I had um, the return to work said, do one hour at your desk at home. And I was maybe 20 minutes in and I thought, I can't do this. I just felt I couldn't sit on the chair. I had no muscle mass. I was, the screen was all flickering at me. I felt dizzy. Um, I didn't know where to begin. I'd forgotten how to email. (laughs) And I was just thinking, how am I supposed to get back to doing the job I used to do? because I just can't see me getting through the next week, let alone that. And it really, like similar to you, Peter, it really shook my confidence. And and I started to think whether I was making the right decision returning. But, um, yeah, I'm glad I did. But, yeah, at the time, yeah, it really wasn't what I thought it was going to be. So, yeah. Um, yes. And did you have brain fog as well, Shashani? Was that something? Because what sort of role are you in? What do you do again? Uh, so I work as an IT engineer for LimePoint. So you so, need your brain switched on. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. At the beginning, like just after the transplant, I couldn't even focus on fixing a puzzle. That was that foggy. And I tend to forget stuff. Uh, yeah. Even now, I feel like I forget what I've been working last week, kind of. And I need to like write down or have them um, in a place where I can remember. Yeah. Or ask my husband sometimes if I forget like some things other than work. Um, yeah, so I, I tend to write down stuff so that I remember yep. and yeah, it takes time to focus on the code also when I develop, no, it takes time than usual. But I yeah. think you do have to put, yeah, put some other measures in place. Um, so Peter, did you find that, did you, there was there different things you had to do to kind of, uh, you know, deal with particularly the first 12 months back at work, um, that helped you? Yes. Um, so I, committed myself to relearning what I thought I'd forgotten. But the odd thing was when I turned the corner and actually the brain fog lifted and it was almost like driving out of a fog, um, I found that I actually knew it. It was all in there anyway. But I relearned a lot of stuff so that I could keep up and do the job that I'd been given to do. Um, But it really just happened on its own that I can point no, I, I can't attribute anything to why I woke up one morning and suddenly my brain seemed to have expanded back to its <laughs> old self. It truly happened overnight and my confidence returned. I mean, I didn't mention that I'm in a fairly responsible portfolio in emergency management here locally mm-hmm. that involves during a bushfire or other event, it involves snappy decision making and a lot of it and a lot of pressure. And I can do those tasks now um, without missing a beat. And I certainly couldn't do it prior to that that light bulb moment. So, yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's a good point to pass on to people is that if they're, yeah, they're feeling like they're not themselves at the start when they go back just to um, kind of, well, hang in there, I suppose is one word, but also look at ways that you can support your bad memory or, Um, you know get support from others there was a different role I took on for a little while that was uh, less uh, I guess no I was I'm not doing the sort of things you're doing Peter with all the emergency things but at least it was going to have less of an impact if I if things didn't quite go 100% Uh, so you know that's something you know people could talk about with their workplace as well Um, what about preparing yourselves mentally before you went back to work was there Anything that you did uh, beforehand? What what was your initial feelings? Was it a little daunting? Was you excited? A bit of both? What about you, Sajani? What? Um, to be honest, it was the, it was both, but mostly exciting to go back to work because, like I said, I felt so helpless, hopeless actually, just to be like I didn't fail myself just sitting at home. Yeah. So yeah, I was excited to go back to work. But as you said, the first week was challenging. I was thinking like, even after starting a few days, even though I was happy, I was like thinking, can I work as much as I did before? Mm -hmm. Uh, Even now that thought crosses my mind. Uh, Yeah, but eventually you'll find your place, like adjust to things and go on. Yeah. No, yeah, that's right. Um, And Peter, same for you or different? All all those things. um, I would echo both what yourself and the journey have said, and I'd probably urge the journey that she'll have her light bulb moment as well. Um, it might be a little soon yet. Um, mm. But I certainly, um, I re-engaged by um, busy going back into the station, revisiting 
work colleagues discussing what was happening, contemporary issues around policing, and getting hold of the computer and going through thousands of emails that were banking up. They didn't seem to stop. The yeah. email system didn't seem to know that I'd had a transplant. I did all that and tried to, you know, just re-engage and, and re-involve myself in the day-to-day argy-bargy of policing. Yeah. And that was pretty good, but I still hit that crisis moment, you know, when I got back in the office, the same as yourself and the journey of suggested, where I sat in front of the computer and went, whoa, you know, gee, I don't know whether I've done the right thing here. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can now look back in all confidence and say, I'm, you know, I've, I've worked through that as we have, as we all have, and um, I'm now back well and truly on track. Yeah. As good as ever. As good yeah, as ever. That's really good. Um, yeah. So apart from the brain fog and the ch- just the physical challenges of, you know, having to focus and, um, you know, be in a, in a routine again, were there any other challenges uh, that you both had to face? For myself, there were moments like when I was taking medicines in the morning, um, I had to, because my work is kind of flexible, I'm thankful for that. Uh, I had to take some hours off because sometimes I get like gastric because mm-hmm. of the medicines and some dizziness. So then it's difficult to focus on work. And that was kind of challenging to adjust the timings. Uh, yeah, so but now I found my balance, like I have my breakfast first and then start working kind of. And in the middle, I sometimes take breaks. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that was something challenging and I uh, wanted exercises in between. So I made a home office at home with some flexible chairs and tables. Uh, yeah, that I just adjusted a bit. Yeah, yeah, no, that sounds good. Um, and what about you, Peter? Any other challenges apart from um, what you mentioned? The med, the med thing's a good one. So um, I work shift work. Um, oh. And, of course, when you're performing certain duties... Anything can be happening. It could be going to any kind of job. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've actually adapted to, so I carry, when I'm when I'm on a shift that is going to involve me having to take my meds, whether that's in the 8 a.m. meds or the 8 p.m. meds, I carry them with me and a bottle of water. And it wouldn't be unusual to work, you know, be working out my meds on the bonnet of the police car while we're actually at a task. And I go, <laughs> oh, hang on, it's 8 o'clock. And I dart off and I take my, my yeah. meds. Now, probably initially I forgot a couple of times. I hope the wrong people aren't listening. But <laughs> That's right. We all forgot a couple of times. One or two times, yep. You know, you, you, yeah. you get sort of off track and and I forgot and they were a couple of hours late and a few things like that. But I can pretty well say with confidence now that it's so embedded that I just work it out. You know, whatever I'm wherever I am at the time and whatever I'm doing at the time, I just time out. Yes. Like, hang on I'll rest you in a minute I've just got to have yes, my minutes. <laughs> exactly yeah yes. <laughs> I like and it's it. worked you know it's worked pretty effectively but yeah. that that was probably the main yeah. the main adjustment I, I think that's yeah. true just fitting fitting the needs of staying alive around mm. the realities of our day-to-day humdrum you know business as usual type stuff and that can be difficult for others to understand a little yeah. bit. that's so right because there's also yeah. a lot of uh follow-up post-transplant too so you still have appointments and you still have blood tests to do and you can have off days um you know myself I've felt queasy every day for 16 plus years and so sometimes being in at work and feeling queasy was not a good combination so I actually had a chat to my manager and asked if I could start later and finish later. So changed my hours till 9.30 till 10. That was kind of pushing it if I got in at 10. But around that 9.30, 10, and I'd stayed all about 6. Um, and I told all my work colleagues about that so that they weren't thinking I was just slacking off um, and milking the transplant. I was like, no, no, this is, you know, imagine having morning sickness forever. And they're like, oh, yeah, you come in when you want sort of thing. <laughs> so that, that definitely helped. And I think... I don't know about you all, but um, sharing what I was going through and the challenges made it easier because at least people kind of understood why I was doing certain things. So how how open were you with your colleagues and manager and workplace about everything? What, or did you find that was useful? Um, in my case, yes. Even they came to see me when I was in uh 
yeah. after the transplant, just after the transplant. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. yeah. So they're like uh, very supportive. They understand like what's the position here, even for the meetings. If there are huge meetings, they're like, it's okay, you don't have to come, it's crowded. And they just ask me to stay at home. Yep. So, um, yeah, they know about the, they always keep asking, how is your checkups? So even if I go for a checkup, they ask, keep asking, how is your checkup? Yep. How well are you doing? And they keep track on my health. That's and, great. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, that would help. Yeah, that would give you um, a, a nice feeling to know that they were backing you like that. Um, what about you, Peter? Um, how, how did it pan out for you? We're a pretty unique mob. Um, so, most of my colleagues were genuinely intrigued by the whole process and actually wanted to know blow by blow uh, <laughs> all about yeah. it. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was completely open with managers um, and uh, colleagues, you know, um, junior members, senior members. I was quite open. And, yeah, I'm an advocate, of course, now for, for um, organ donation and so on, and I take every opportunity I can to nudge people and say, are you an organ donor? Yeah. You know, yeah. And so a lot of, and, and I'm in an environment where, you know, there's hundreds, well, 120, 130 of us, and we all know each other really well. And every one of those people probably knows my story mm. to some degree or another. So, and that includes managers. So that's yeah. been very helpful actually is in an advocacy sense. And yeah. also, um, people don't ask silly questions or make silly demands because yeah. I understand what's involved. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, certainly um, I think everyone going through the pandemic made people maybe understand our situation a bit better. I know I'm, mm. I, I definitely had people say to me, oh, now I understand what you were going through all those years and about the coughing and the group mm. people and, and all of that. Um, so I guess just to share a little bit more about where I'm at now, um, when I was working at Shell um, post transplant for a few years, I did find that I would get coughed on. Now, I'm not sure if it's going to be different nowadays with post-COVID, the way people act in workplaces, but definitely back then, you know, if something was going around the office, I would end up getting it. Uh, and so I did take the decision a couple of years after my transplant to leave Shell and then take up uh, more of a consulting and I've got my own business now. And it does help because when I have times where I'm not feeling so great or I need a bit of a rest, then, yeah, I'm, I'm my own boss so I can kind of take that time out. So I want to throw that in there too because I know some people will come back to work and it'll be their own business. So there's that. There's also the pressure of it is still you've got to earn money and, you know, the clients, you know, I, I've had times where I've been on Zoom meetings and uh, had to quickly put them all into, um, you know, breakout rooms on Zoom so I could cough <laughs> and have a big glass of water because I was just <laughs> uh, But, I yeah, I, I share and I, I agree, sharing the story has been great. It's actually helped with my business. I thought it would put people off thinking I was sick and not maybe reliable. Um, but in actual fact, the transplant story has really helped, especially with a, a you know resilience business and those sorts of things. So I think it's, yeah, for me, again, like you guys, it was good to share. Um, so uh, mindful of time, we could talk about this for hours, but uh, let's refocus a bit. <laughs> um, what, a, what other advice would you give to lung transplant patients who are considering returning to work? Um, what I would say is, uh, your health comes first, but then you have to do what you like. So whoever likes, it's okay if you don't like to work, but if you do like to work, you have to give it a shot. And there are ways to overcome your challenges and problems. There are people to talk and get advice from. And so there's always a way to find, uh, to do what you like. And also one thing I did, I, just an extra thing apart from working is that I've started a, because I'm not feeling, I didn't feel like myself before. So I wanted to be uh, happy like before. So mm -hmm. I started an Instagram profile and now it's public and uh, yeah. it's like, it, I newly started like around one month ago to document my traveling, um, uh, traveling content. Right. So that's something I like. I can yeah. share with you. If you like, you can give a follow also. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so try what you like. That's what I have to say. Because 
even if you are not a transplant patient, you get challenges in life. Mm. So we just have to face them. Yeah, no, that's very true. That, and I think that's the thing we we kind of we're in our transplant bubble some days, and we <laughs> forget that everyone else has issues and problems and challenges too. Uh, so, yeah, we we just have our own version of. Um, and what about you, Peter? What what would be some advice uh, that you give others? Well, um, one thing that just popped into my mind then when the Jani spoke was that we're part of a fairly, I think we're part of a fairly exclusive club of people who have faced adversity and the fears that are involved with with these things and the knowledge that, you know, you may not have that much long left to live, you know, prior to transplant and then the journey through that. And I feel very proud of that, to be honest, to be part of that group. And Mm. I I feel very protective of others that are in in our group. And I know there are others, there are cancer sufferers and other groups in society that have similar issues and no doubt they feel the same way well i feel very protective of our of our uh, group um probably the key piece of advice that i would give are that i think everyone is going to feel that crisis of confidence i'm sure we're not alone um you know if we all feel it i guess everyone does and just encourage people to work through that to push through that not let that daunt them because a better day will come and their faculties should and will probably return to at least what they were prior to their operation, if not better. I feel sometimes like Benjamin Button. I actually feel better now than I felt 20 years ago, and I'm serious when I say that. Yeah. Well, you're probably getting more oxygen to your brain uh, because your lungs are working better. So there's probably some science behind that, I would think. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would urge people to work yeah. Through those, you know, through those fears, those yeah. prices of confidence, and just forge on, and there will be a better, mm-hmm. there will be a better time once yeah. they yeah. they turn that corner. Yep. Um, so that would be my key piece of advice, and also I think full, I think full disclosure with friends, colleagues, and managers. Mm. I feel that way. Some would argue against that. Probably say, oh, I don't want to tell people too much, but. I believe the more people know about your personal journey, the more they can acknowledge the things we have to do mm. on a day-to-day basis that we've got to fit around our work. Um, and I've certainly felt that by, yeah. by being fully open and fully honest that people have just stepped aside and allowed me to do what I needed to do um, on a day-to-day basis yeah. um, to be at work and and fulfill my career yeah 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 i think that's um yeah i think all of the advice um you and sajani have shared is very valuable and yeah you don't know how you're going to go when like i, I mean i had naively thought i was just going to bounce back into you know, what i used to do before and it'll all be fine i'll be working a full day and um, and it really shocked me. Um, so I actually reached out for external help. And I know that's, you know, not necessarily within everyone's power, but you can certainly go through your GP and get a mental health plan and or talk to the social workers or other people. And we obviously got our longitude peer support where you can talk to other people as well. And I found that really helpful because one of the things which she used to say to me was um, one day at a time, Wendy, <laughs> you know, don't try to, be right back where you were within a month. That's just not practical. So we would talk about, okay, see if you can work half a day. Uh, See if you can do, you know, um, a spreadsheet. See if you can uh, go to a meeting. Like, so it was all little wins. And so each time I'd go, oh, yeah, I managed to do that. Um, or, you know, send an email to my manager about a particular thing I was working on, it was just another tick of like, oh, yeah, I actually can do this. Um, and, yes, there were times where I probably didn't do as well. as <laughs> I Obviously, like I said, my um, colleagues and manager were like following me around, checking on things, but that's okay. And eventually they stopped, <laughs> so get back on track. And I agree, Peter, sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm juggling more balls and doing more complex stuff than I used to do. And I don't know if it's because you push yourself a bit more in our situation, but I just feel like, yeah, I get I get a lot more. I get even more done. I thought I was busy. At, well, I try not to use that word, but I thought I had a, 
you know, a full plate when I was at Shell, but I reckon I do even more now and can manage that. So, yeah, surprising. Um, okay, so I think we've covered a lot of the things, but is there just any anything else final that you're thinking, oh, I just really wanted to share that or something else that has popped up as we're talking? I actually think uh, we have to think that it's all right to feel not okay. We just mm-hmm. have to, um, yeah, think of that. And if, if if you feel sad or tired or whatever because of this transplant, we just have to say like what you said one day at a time. And as everything is temporary, our sadness will also go away. We'll be happy eventually. Uh, you're yeah. a wise, you're a wise soul. <laughs> I think we could learn a lot from you. Uh, but yes, I agree. I think that's uh, very, very wise words. Um, what about you, Peter? Anything else you wanted to pop in there or add in? Oh, I think just quickly, um, be kind to yourself, which probably builds on everything we we've already discussed. Be kind and don't um don't expect too much from yourself and don't punish yourself when you don't quite reach that peak that you you want to reach at any given time. And that if you're kind to yourself and you remain healthy, you eat well, you exercise, you have good friends and a good support group, and you can reach out and speak honestly with whomever you need to, yeah. the benefits and rewards will flow from that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. And so I think, yeah, in summary, you know, if, if people are wanting to return to work, then, yeah, definitely uh, worth considering. There's plenty of us, like we're, we're just the tip of the iceberg. I know many people who are back working, um, some part-time, some permanently, uh, full-time, Others have set up their own businesses. Um, some are doing both. Like I think, um, like you were saying, Thajani, people get inspired, so they do all sorts of other things. And, you know, people have gone on to have promotions, um, you know, lead others, all sorts of things. So you don't necessarily um, have to be restricted because of your transplant either. Um, now, I know that, you know, for some people they still do struggle post-transplant, so we do acknowledge that as well and, and you know, there will be some stories where it is harder to get back into work, especially if you had a very physical um, job beforehand. And so, again, that's being kind to yourself, like Peter said. Um, but, yeah, we we definitely are very happy to talk to people who are considering this, through the, whether it's through the peer network or you just want to reach out to us at Longitude. Uh, and, yeah, I want to thank Arthur, Jani and Peter very much for jumping on and sharing their stories. And uh, this is going to be a longer video than we'd planned, but actually I think it's going to be worth it. So um, you can speed us up on, you know, I, I call it chipmunk speed where you, <laughs> you play it a bit fast and you sound like we're talking very fast um, if you want to get through it quicker. But, uh, yeah, I think hopefully uh, we've shared some things which might be helpful. So thank you again and we will uh, wrap it up there and, uh, yeah, all the best for everyone who decides to return to work. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Peter. Bye. Thanks very much, Wendy.